chance for escape. Put down your weapons now and be treated with charity and kindness. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome. I'm Josh Dreyfais, and today we're going back to 1999, joining the OSS, loading up the M1 Garand, and showing our papers to absolutely everyone as we replay the classic PlayStation 1 first-person shooter, Medal of Honor, and ask, was it any good? Now, I have some great memories of this game. When I was around 9 or 10, I'd sit and watch my granddad play this for hours on a small CRT television. It was one of my first experiences of a video game. And when I was a little older, my granddad and I would play the multiplayer against each other. So I remember this game being great, but nostalgia has a way of warping our memories. So let's go back, finish the game, and see if it still holds up today. Before we begin, a massive thank you to all the supporters on Patreon and Twitch who keep the channel alive. More on how you can support at the end. For now, let's begin. Hey, remember when DreamWorks had a sense of humour and animated their logo to do something cool and specific to the product it was being used in? Like the kid parachuting off the moon in this game. Yeah, <laughs> good times. Game starts and there's an intro movie. Actually quite a good intro movie with some quite good voice acting we'll look at later. Medal of Honor 1 used real historical footage for the game's opening and a fictional briefing for every mission you then did. All the missions were based on real events but they didn't use actual real names for places. Now they got most of the fictional events pretty spot on to actual major events of the war but because this is YouTube I can't say the G word that rhymes with run or the N word that relates to the antagonist of World War 2 so because I'm middle class British, I'll be replacing them with Rooty Tooty Point and Shooty and the Jerrys. Because the slang term for the British and Germans during that period of time were Tommies and Jerrys. The game starts and the main menu is an office. All the selections like start game, multiplayer, options or passwords because this is a game made when memory cards were still a thing. While this kind of menu layout isn't practical, I like the character that it adds. You could just have boxes with writing on, but no, you are Soldier Jimmy Patterson. This is your office. This is where you'll be briefed on every mission before you embark. It ties into the story, and it helps add some character to something as simple as a menu screen. Now, the gameplay itself, well, Medal of Honor was made before analog sticks were a thing, so you used the D-pad to move, and the late 90s were a wild time for first-person shooter games because controls hadn't yet been standardised. Now, every first-person shooter game uses roughly the same kind of layout, because player accessibility is a big important selling point, but not here. Forward and back would move you forward and back, left and right turn you left and right, L1 and R1 are strafe. To shoot, you press X. To jump, you press triangle. Switch weapons is circle, but you can only switch through in one direction, and square is reload, or interact. Whatever the game thinks you're trying to do based on context, we'll see the issues with this later. The first mission has us hunting down a crashed plane. We're working with the French resistance, and each mission starts with a note written by Manon, laying out our base objectives. There are seven missions in the game, broken into multiple short levels. Medal of Honor isn't a long game. Each individual level section is about ten minutes, and it took me about six hours to finish the whole game. Now shooting isn't the smoothest of mechanics. X is shoot and you'll fire straight in front of you, but to aim you need to hold R2 and then the crosshair appears and you can move the crosshair. But while you're aiming like this, you can't move. This often means levels become move to the next encounter, hide somewhere and take pot shots at the enemy. Standing up in the open while trying to aim is always a bad idea. Medal of Honor is a very cautious game, right up until you get the machine rooty tooty point and shooty, where running screaming at the enemy becomes the best tactic ever. Because of the very limited PlayStation 1 draw distance, you won't see enemies until they can also see you, so shooting quickly is essential. But a really nice touch is there is location-based damage. Shooting an enemy on the foot does less damage than a body shot. It sounds simple now, but it wasn't widespread at the time. Plus, if you can headshot an enemy wearing a helmet, you can ping the helmet off them and startle them, then quickly take another shot to take them out. And shooting the helmets off the heads of enemies is still fun eight hours in. Now, your hit points are an issue, because again, late 90s game design, no recharging shields here. You get hit, you take damage, your health goes down. It's staying down until you find a medical canteen, a health pack, or a field kit. Now, the good side of the levels being short is when you die, and you will, because you really can't take that many hits, and you won't know where the enemies are until you've gone through the levels, you will restart. Once you have learned the level route, though, 
the respawn points of the enemies and the enemy reaction times, you really can just run through them quite quickly. The limitation of the hardware means you couldn't actually render that many enemies at one go, so you're never swamped. You'll find lone guards, sometimes a patrol, but the most I ever fought in one go was four. And because the enemy numbers are so few, the enemy damage is increased to compensate. One enemy soldier can take half your health away if you're not paying attention. Going up against four enemies is a challenge, and if the enemy has a bazooka, well, it's pretty much a one-hit kill against you. The enemies aren't difficult, but they're not dumb either. They will run for cover. They will lie down to be harder to hit, unless they're behind a railing, because they can't shoot through the railing. So they'll lie down, then stand up, then lie down, then stand up, then lie down, then stand up forever. And if you throw a grenade at them, well, they will pick it up and throw it right back at you. It's the small details like this that help you feel that you're fighting against other soldiers, not just mindless lines of code. The issues with aiming become apparent when you're trying to respond quickly. You need to aim, but you don't want to be locked in place. So I remember, and I'm sure I'm not the only person who did this, I drew a really small dot in the very centre of my actual CRT TV with dry erase marker so I could aim without needing to actually aim. And if you did that too, you now have to like the video and subscribe to the channel. The opening few levels are all extremely linear. The paths curve to hide the draw distance limitations, and while there are what you'd consider secret areas, they're never extensive. A small ammo cache behind a gap in the hedge, or a room behind a fake air vent with some health in it. The levels aren't big apart from the gas facility, which is awful and we'll see later. The square button reloads, but it's also context action, meaning place bombs, activate switches, or man the big belt-fed rooty tooty point and shooty. There's an interesting mechanic in Medal of Honor where when you take control of a pillbox, enemies will spawn and run straight at you, and they will never stop spawning. Now, you can just sit there happily mowing them down to your heart's content, but there's no benefit to actually doing this. It only takes a few enemies to get a few lucky shots off on you to kill you, so when you see an encampment, there's always the thought of, actually, it's not worth activating this. And I think that's a really weak game design choice. Making the player avoid using a fun mechanic because it doesn't actually benefit them never feels good. Each level has a list of objectives, and they're always presented in the order you're actually going to encounter them, so there's very little backtracking if you play properly. Of course, you can miss a very obvious objective, reach the end of the level where it'll shout at you, not all objectives completed, and you have to walk all the way back to find it. But in general, you'll complete as you go. And when you do complete a level, you'll get a quick performance review. Now, I cannot for the life of me work out how it's choosing how many stars to give me. I finish a level fast but get shot a lot, three stars. I do the next one stealthy and don't get seen, two stars. I finish a level not being hit, one star. I get absolutely wrecked in one mission and only survive by using the health packs, three stars and a medal. There's probably a formula here. I have no idea what it is. Now, the first few missions see you helping the French resistance by finding some downed pilots or recovering a cache of weapons from the sewers, and the written briefings for each mission are provided by the French resistance fighter Manon, which ties really nicely into the sequel Medal of Honor Underground, where you play as Manon. So the controls aren't standardised, but they are passable. The draw distance is extremely limited, but to cover up the use of that, they have shorter view distance levels and winding tunnels instead of large open areas. And the aiming is awkward while moving, and using the crosshair limits your movement. So actually, there's not a lot mechanically amazing here. But it's not about mechanics. It's the character and the feeling of Medal of Honor that makes it memorable. And I think the single biggest contributor to the feeling of this game is the music. Playing Medal of Honor makes you feel like you're in an old Hollywood war film. The kind of film that placed Hollywood glamour and the fictional nobility of combat above the gritty reality of war. You feel like you're a classic leading man in a war drama, and the strongest enhancer of this is the music. The score goes from ambient and diegetic, like skulking through the Parisian sewers, to this epic orchestral overture by Michael Giacchino, who would later go on to score Medal of Honor Underground and the PlayStation 2 entry, Frontline. Think of those old World War II black and white films, the kind you'd catch on a Sunday evening already halfway through, and you'd see the hero valiantly fighting behind enemy lines, and the music would carry you along on this epic, sweeping adventure. This music is exactly that. The music of this game is every concentrated Hollywood stereotype of beautiful conflict, and it seeps into your bones and makes you feel like a badass. It brings the drama to a dramatic game. It gets the blood 
pumping. And while you're playing, you can almost forgive the mechanical weaknesses of the controls because the actual feeling of playing Medal of Honor is so intense. And I'm confident in saying Medal of Honor would not have succeeded without this absolutely stellar music. <laughs> Let's go back to mechanical issues. You can't look up or down easily. The only way to look up or down is to manually use the crosshair to aim and this really becomes an issue when you use ramps. When you're ascending or descending a ramp, your vision doesn't automatically tilt up or down to match the orientation of the floor. You remain horizontal to the majority of the level. So when there's an enemy above or below you, you've got to waste valuable seconds manually aiming and tilting to shoot. Combat on ramps just isn't very good. And this is especially obvious when dogs are running at you. Now attack dogs in any game are normally awkward and awful to deal with. Thankfully, they only take one or two shots here. But it was here I noticed even more brilliant sound design that really reinforced the idea sound carried this game. You will occasionally hear dogs barking or enemy footsteps running towards you or the crack of a pistol in the distance. But then you realize it's just a fake out. They can't fill the game with enemies, so they use the soundtrack to trick you and keep the tension up. You're never sure if it's an enemy approaching you around the corner or just a sound effect, and you are constantly on edge because of this. Some of the middle levels do throw new paths at you, some twists and turns, but they're never long diversions, so taking a wrong turn isn't too costly. You can backtrack pretty quickly, and you'll have the whole level memorized within two or three attempts. Oh, quick Easter egg. If you sit on the main menu and do nothing, eventually the game's advert will start playing, which is actually quite funny and definitely worth a watch. I'll link it in the description below. One more mechanical issue. You know, now I've started writing this script, you realise the game does have a lot of small mechanical issues. The enemy guards have collision detection and you can't move through them. So sometimes in a spy mission, you'll get stuck behind them on corners. This is especially bad where you need to be sneaky and you're just spamming jump to try and get unstuck. Now we get to the obligatory sniper level, except they've suddenly remembered the draw distance on the PS1 was terrible. The sniper fires slowly and isn't a one-shot kill, meaning you can't actually see what you're meant to be sniping until you're close enough to use a better weapon. I get what they were going for here, but the hardware limitation has really held them back. In some levels you'll see these alarm boxes. If you're spotted, enemies will activate them, which makes all the enemies on the level aggressive, but it doesn't actually spawn any new ones, so having an alarm activated isn't the end of the world. Plus you can just turn it off again and then everything is fine. Oh, remember these short draw distance? Here is a really unfair, unfun example. You walk down this path, straight into a machine rooty tooty point and shooty encampment, and you get shredded. You can't see the enemy until you're close enough to shoot them, which means they're close enough to shoot you, and this is the only time the game does this. This feels really cheap. Now we're off to blow up the Rail Cannon Gustav, again a historically accurate event, although in the game they call it Greta, one of the largest cannons ever made. I think the real operation involved hundreds of soldiers and intelligence officers, not one dude who had difficulty looking up. Oh, quick notice, your ammunition is also conserved between level sections of the same mission, so if you used up all your bullets, narrowly escaping the last phase, be prepared to hunt down some ammo or use your basically useless punch attack. Now the third mission takes us onto the German U-boat as we impersonate a Kriegsmarine officer and attempt to sabotage the boat from within, and it is this mission that you will hear the line that will haunt your dreams. Ihre Papiere, bitte. Your papers, please. Your papers, please. Show me your papers. Who's your commanding officer? Your papers. Good lord, did they not realise how repetitive they made this? So in this mission, you need to sneak, not shoot, and every single enemy soldier will demand to see your papers, so you press X to show them, and then they walk off. Now sometimes they'll challenge you, and you have to hope this happens in a secluded area, so you can kill them and not trigger an alarm. But once you've done the mission a couple of times and you're heading back through the ship, soldiers you've already shown your papers to will want to see them again. 
And if you don't stop, turn around and show them again, they'll begin shooting. This mission truly is, show me your papers, the mission. There are also no checkpoints in any level, no save spots, so each section is a complete run. And if you fail, which you will, because this is mostly trial and error, you're starting again. In some parts, even though it's a stealth mission, your best bet is to kill everybody. As long as no one activates an alarm, and you kill everyone that saw you killing people, you can still claim you've been somewhat stealthy. And if you think I'm kidding about the excessive use of the papers mechanic, I've made you a handy dandy montage. Who's your commanding officer? Forgive me, sir. Who's your commanding officer? Your papers Stop. are in order. Help the alarm! May I see your papers, please? Your papers are in order. It won't happen again. Forgive me, sir. Forgive me, sir. Now onto a level that makes me really sad. Because it's really well made, but it doesn't work for the game. The rooftop level is an absolute maze of lower, narrow paths, open parking spaces and ladders taking you to the rooftop, and this should be a memorable section, but it's so frustrating because the use of the vertical design space in this level is fantastic, but the controls just do not allow you to enjoy it. The difficulty looking up or down, the limited draw distance, the awkward use of ladders, the fact you need to jump but you can't see the edge of what you're standing on easily. This is a brilliant bit of set design that's really difficult to fully appreciate. It sometimes feels like the level designers wanted to make really intricate levels but the controls just didn't reach the same levels of quality. What I have realised is that Medal of Honor is at its best when it's not trying to be a serious war game. It works when it's basically a dime store pulp war novel. A heroic tale of daring do, the good guy punching the bad guy's lights out. It's not trying to make a statement about the horrors of war or the human cost of conflict. It's just a slightly over the top romp of a singular regular soldier saving the day. We do need to talk about the ladders though, because when they're out in the open, they are bearable. But once you're in the U-boat, oh boy. Standing near a ladder means pressing forward doesn't move you forward anymore, it now moves you up. You're effectively stuck to the ladder. So let's say you spin around and face away from the ladder and you assume pressing forward moves you away, but no, you're still on the ladder, so back up you go. Which means if you get to the bottom of the ladder, but you're not quite at the bottom, you turn around and walk off, you just shoot back up. And if you're being shot at by the enemy, the awkward transition phase from being on to being off the ladder can cause you to lose a lot of health, especially if there's an enemy blocking your ability to get off the ladder. Next up, we're in Fort Schmerzen, a highly defended fortress buried in the hills. And in the briefing, we're told you're not the first agent we've sent in. And this is a lovely bit of characterization. So let's just look at the characters for a second. You are Jimmy Patterson, highly skilled soldier, but you're not given too much backstory beyond that. You've been accepting orders from the Colonel Stanley Hargrove, voiced by William Morgan Shepard, who has done an absolute ton of voice acting in his long and storied career. And it seems the acting bug runs in William Morgan Shepard's family, because William Morgan Shepard's son is Mark Shepard, an actor you may know as playing Crowley in Supernatural. The focus of the game isn't the backstory of the characters, it's the gameplay, but there are rare flashes of nice human touches, like how the French resistance fighter Manon mentions her brother was killed in a raid against the Jerrys, or how later the Colonel gives you a personal reason for his desire for a mission to succeed. You never connect with these characters in-game, but they're given just enough characterization to feel like people and not robots. Here's a really nice touch. At the start of the game, when the enemies spot you, they shout American soldier. Once you're inside the base, there's a PA announcement just for you. Have a listen. Attention, American commando. You are surrounded and there is no chance for escape. Put down your weapons now and be treated with charity and kindness. You'll notice in the announcement they refer to you as American Commando. Now, you've not been promoted and you aren't actually officially a commando, they just think you are. Then, in the final mission of the game, when an enemy spots you, they actually shout, it's Jimmy Patterson. You are now a named enemy in their world. 
Is it Jimmy Patterson? This is a lovely in-game bit of characterization as you can see how the enemy feels about you from your increased involvement in their plans. Now the second half of the game does see the difficulty ramp up. Suddenly enemies take more hits to kill and they fire back at you a lot faster. You're sent off to Norway to single-handedly stop the production of the atom bomb. This is also the first open plan level. You can use the air vents to get around and you need to explore the complex and you need to backtrack quite a lot now. And I think the open plan level makes you realise why they didn't do this more. Because the scenery looks so similar and all of the tunnels look identical and navigation is difficult. You do have a compass, but you don't have a mini-map. So unless you're someone who actually thinks in north, south, east and west instead of left and right, it's not going to help you find your way around. In fact, the frustration of trying to navigate the open levels kind of makes you miss the linear layout somewhat. Look at this, this is awful. These scientists surrender and then they shoot me when my back's turned. That is just not cricket. This is also the first time the game uses dynamic lighting, this red flashing alarm. It's such a simple effect, but the fact this is the first time I've seen it used makes it stand out. Now, the final two missions of the game really do bring all the great map design elements together. We're interacting with chemical vats to stop the production of heavy water. We're climbing ladders, using walkways as vantage points, sneaking through vents, jumping over boxes, ducking behind railings, throwing grenades down ramps. It feels like the level designers found some new confidence toward the end of the game and just threw the best they could make at us. Enemies hiding round corners, hidden ammo caches, first aid packs in boxes. The game really comes into its own around mission six, which is a shame because there's only seven missions. Here's another bit of humanization. It's subtle, but it's great that it's there. I know it's easy to just gun down hordes of enemies thinking they're all mindless drones, but look! They've built a snowman! Now I know this is a really small, insignificant part of the level, but to me this is visual storytelling. It's humanised the enemies, and it makes the constant slaughter of them morally ambiguous. Well, right up until they start throwing grenades at me again. Then it's open season on Jerry's once again. Finish this mission in record time, take very little damage, kill every enemy quickly, blow the ferry up and still only get one star. What do you want me to do, Medal of Honor? How does your rating system work? Here's more subtle characterization, but I love it. We're sent into a mine. We're told the Jerry's are stashing priceless historical treasures, including major artistic finds they've stolen, and they're going to rig the mine to blow up, because if they can't have it, no one can. And in the mission briefing, the colonel says this. They've looted art from personal collections and museums, stealing almost the entire cultural heritage of Western civilization. Now, I know I might not look it, but my college minor was art history, and it gives me grief to no end when I think about everything that's been lost in this war, all the art that's been destroyed in the never-ending artillery barrages and bombing raids. I love that. That fleshes out the Colonel. I know he's a faceless character, but he's got hopes and dreams and history and desires and personal attachments to this mission. It makes the stakes feel higher even though mechanically nothing has changed. We also want to save the art because so far the Colonel has been decent to us. Along with saving all the beautiful art, we discover the subtle beauty of the bazooka. Now I know this mission is meant to be somewhat stealthy, but if you've got a bazooka, you can use it in a stealthy way. Because if everyone's dead, there's no one alive to say that you weren't stealthy. The only problem with having access to a bazooka on this map is... So do the enemy. And it's a one-hit kill if they hit you. And trust me, they'll hit you. The final mission of the game sees us heading into the heart of the enemy territory to disable and sabotage the V2 rocket project, and we're given access to every weapon, and the game designers throw everything at you. Tight corridors, open spaces, enemy snipers, enemy shotgunners, grenades, heavily fortified encampments, hidden first aid packs, everything you've experienced so far is in this final mission. Apart from this enemy, who drops a grenade on death, and this catches me unaware, and I die, because this is the only time the game does this. Eventually you reach the final launch room, sabotage the guidance system, launch the rocket which falls straight back down and explodes only meters from you, but you're fine because you're Jimmy Patterson, of course you're fine. And now you're done with the main game, but you've still got multiplayer, which honestly, 
and I know you're going to hate me for this, isn't that good. I know, you had a great time when you were a kid. So did I. But looking back at it now, extremely limited level selection, very limited weapon selection, and a minimap which constantly shows you where the other person is, combined with having to stand still to aim means the bazooka is the best weapon by a country mile, and if you went and played this now, you'd find it a spam of run at the other person with a machine gun and hope for the best. It was okay for the PlayStation 1 at the time, but in the same year, Unreal Tournament released. And as far as multiplayer goes, Unreal Tournament absolutely blows this out the water. So while the multiplayer is fun for a bit for two people, it does not have that much replayability. The main game of Medal of Honor is short, and honestly, it's not great mechanically. The few unique mechanics they do use, like the papers, can get repetitive quickly. Hardware limitations and strange controls means the moment-to-moment -moment gameplay isn't the smoothest, and the mechanics they wanted to make work, like snipers or vertical design, didn't come together as well as they had hoped. And the multiplayer is good for an evening, but doesn't have a great deal of depth to it. But the gameplay and all of its mechanical flaws are honestly carried by the fantastic soundtrack. The music in this game still holds up. If you remade this game, don't even change the music. It's perfect. It carries the entire experience and it makes you feel like a golden age of cinema war hero. So Medal of Honor 1, 1999 for the PlayStation 1. It's fun, it's an enjoyable way to spend a day or two, but the most important thing it did was start something. We all know the legacy that Medal of Honor would spawn. The original Call of Duty would release four years later, heavily inspired by Medal of Honor. And now the story-driven first-person shooter is a dominating genre within the gameplay medium. Mechanically, it's not as great as you remember. But it's fun, it sounds fantastic, and it makes you feel pretty cool. So to end this replay, I will award Medal of Honor... Ihre Papiere, bitte. Your papers, please. Out of 10. Cheers for watching. Thank you again to the supporters on Patreon and Twitch who keep the channel alive. You can support from only £1 a month. Check the video description for links to the Patreon, Twitch, Twitter and our Discord. And, as always... Rent um euer Leben. Er hat ne Panzerfaust. Run for your lives. He has a bazooka. Electronic Arts and DreamWorks Interactive present Medal of Honor. Prepare for your finest hour.